I love these questions for that reason, because they're doing so much work for you and you can just be like in response to them. Yes, we're going to turn this into action in a minute, but in the beginning, I think the power of these kinds of questions and the pleasure of these kinds of questions is just that they're like, you have a lot of this inside of you. You have this knowing inside of yourself. And it's just a matter of like, create a channel, create a, uh, a line of communication for the answers to this to come through to you. And it's right there for you. Like, we don't need to do more than that. You just need to ask good questions. Hey, it's Samantha Hartley of the Profitable Joyful Consulting Podcast. This is season 16, and we are talking about powerful questions. There's questions that like prompt your ideas about the kinds of things that you should be doing. And then there are questions that are philosophical questions that give you insights into meaning and self-discovery. And today's question for me was kind of, it's actually two questions, was kind of uh, in the middle of those. I feel when I ask this question that it puts me in touch with, like, what do you really wanna be doing with yourself? And it also gives me specific um, tactical actions that I can take to be more in accordance with my goals, my intentions, and like what I want to be doing with myself. So uh, it's a two-part question, and it comes from James Clear. And if you don't get his uh, newsletter, I highly recommend it. It's great. He's also the author of Atomic Habits. And I, I just find, uh, you know, he asks the question in every newsletter, and some of them are perfectly good. And some of them are the ones that I'm like, snapshot, you know, take a screenshot of that one and set that one aside and then come back to it and think about it over and over again. So uh, there's two questions here, as I mentioned, and um, I'm going to go through some potential answers for them, but I would also love for you to just write them down. Uh, if you get his newsletter, you've probably heard them before, but uh, this is your reminder to like think about this again and then revisit this from time to time when you're doing uh, reflection, whether it's weekly or monthly. So the first question is, what am I spending too much time doing? And the second one is, what am I spending too little time doing? And what I think is so powerful about these questions is that for me, as I mentioned, like philosophically, I'll get the, what am I spending too much time doing? And I feel like, yeah, like I get that. Um, I uh, start my, my mind, um, my inner child, my, um, you know, executive function, like all those parts of me have a point of view on that. And they start giving their opinions almost as soon as that question enters my mind. So asking a question like that and then giving your mind space for it to answer it is uh, the way to really get in touch with like deep feedback from within yourself. That's the kind of thing that I you can ask right before you enter into a labyrinth. If you're going to walk a labyrinth, the labyrinth is like a meditative exercise. Or if you're about to embark on a trail walk with your dog by yourself, like this is the kind of um, question you might ask. If you have a thought partner or a buddy that you think about things with, and this is the kind of thing for um, for you to discuss, and my thought partners and buddies and I have discussed this, my husband and I have discussed this, like, what are we spending too much time on? Really, really delving into that. And then obviously, like, what am I spending not enough time on? And then you have this like feeling of like yearning and, and oh, this is like where I, I need to go and things they need to do. I love these questions for that reason, because they're doing so much work for you and you can just be like in response to them. Yes, we're going to turn this into action in a minute, but in the beginning, I think the power of these kinds of questions and the pleasure of these kinds of questions is just that they're like, you have a lot of this inside of you. You have this knowing inside of yourself and it's just a matter of like, create a channel create a uh, a line of communication for the answers to this to come through to you and it's right there for you like we don't need to do more than that you just need to ask good questions from time to time and i would say on a regular basis first one carefully composing email responses 
I have a client and I have actually many clients who will do this, but the theme of the week with some of my clients has been stop spending so damn much time composing this careful email response and pick up the phone pick up the phone and have a meeting with somebody. So context, you have a, a situation with a client where you, let's say you're doing some work for them and something goes awry on the client's end or the client is upset about something or they have a question and they've done a little gymnastics in their mind and now they might be upset about it. So you get uh, an email or something like that from them expressing some sort of dissatisfaction. Maybe it's a question, but you hear like a tone in the email. Here's what we don't do. I'm going to carefully compose a response back to this. And then they get it and they write their response. And I write my careful response. Like, I really want to have this like pen pal kind of a relationship with my client where I'm careful. I want to make sure it's documented, right? In corporate, we would be like, well, you want to have everything in an email so that it's all documented. Yeah, no, this is with clients. Stop that process. Pick up the phone and clarify it. I had a client a few years ago that we were doing some done for you work, wrote an email, sent an email over, and I could tell from the tone of it that something was like awry. And there was my opportunity. Like I could have been like, well, actually, what really happened is this. And you might be perceiving it this way, but it's really this way. No, 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 no. I went, pick up the phone and called. Person answered right away, cleared it up. It's like two and a half minutes. And the whole situation is resolved. If that had been this like email chain back and forth, then it just blows up into, you know, it takes on a life of its own. So carefully composing email responses is a thing that is too much time is spent on that in consultants businesses. Are you uh, trying to enroll a client and, and sign them up? And there's they have a lot of questions. So maybe you've been having meetings with them. Maybe they've even seen a proposal at this point. And there's a lot of questions they have. So they're sending over those questions by email and you're wanting to respond to those questions by email. No, 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 no. Pick up that phone and continue closing that client. The process of enrolling a client is like, we do this live. You want to sit with them while they are hearing, receiving, and processing certain information. The process of deciding to work with you, that's the kind of thing where you want to sit with them as they're doing that. So in general, I find consultants spend too much time avoiding a phone conversation. And I'll have other examples of that um, as I go through this. But just remember, the phone is like, it's a superpower in this day and age because there's a whole generation that doesn't even want to get on the phone. And I'll be honest, I do not love phone. However, in this, these kinds of situations in the high intimacy level of our work, the phone is your friend. Cool. Second thing, posting on LinkedIn. A lot of consultants are spending way too much time posting on LinkedIn, but aren't we supposed to be visible? Yes. And the way to get clients on LinkedIn is not exclusively by posting. And so make sure that posting is part of an integrated strategy and not a comfort zone. I won't say more about that. If that's you, you know who you are. And if you want to know more about that information, um, contact me. Third thing, consultants spend way too much time trying to figure it out on their own. Do not try to figure it out on your own. There are people who are ahead of you on this. Uh, they know how to run a consulting business and they can tell you stop doing it that way stop doing it that way do this this way oh this is actually much easier so when clients come to me i feel like oh my gosh poor you it's been like five years and you've been charging this ridiculous rate uh you've been allowing the clients to boss you around you don't have uh this situation put in place your ip is not protected like etc cetera, etc cetera. i'm not saying hire me although i highly recommend that you do i'm saying this is a known thing. So get help in your business, in the way that you're running your business, um, on the technology. Somebody knows how to do that in the all of this other piece over here, like your actual specialty thing that you do, like you might be super good at it and you might feel like, but I have some gaps here. Good. Learn how to do those. But bring in help now. Uh, but I can't, I'm not sure I can afford that. I'm a believer in investing ahead of the growth because what it does is it gives you confidence and it, it gives you skills that are going to make you more valuable. And let's put some pressure on ourselves to bring in some more um, work. If you need help bringing in more clients so that you can afford to invest in yourself, then that's know that when you're reaching out to someone that they you need to make sure that that piece is also covered. So figuring out out on your own, it delays, uh, you know, 
it delays your inevitable eventual success. It delays um, that feeling of confidence and the contribution that you're going to be able to make when you're really being helped. Figuring out on your own is uh, it's lonely, it's frustrating, it makes the journey less fun, it makes the, the hard slog part of the journey take longer. When I look at my clients who I've worked with for a while, not even 10 years, although yes, but the clients I've worked with for just like two years, they're so different now. One of my clients I was talking to earlier today, she had been working 80 hour weeks, like inconceivable to me. And now like she took the entirety of last week off because she can. And she is one of many who will tell you, I'm working less in my business than I ever did. And my business is more successful than it was when I was working 80 hour weeks. So if you're trying to figure it out on your own, just know it is so much easier when you bring in help who can help you figure out the stuff that you're trying to figure out. And it's just like, it's not profitable. It's not joyful. It's just a long, painful road. So bring in the help you need, whether it's me or somebody else. Another thing that I have seen that my clients are spending too much time doing, way too much time defending boundaries. So here's the deal with boundaries is that we have to know our boundaries, right? Like, what are my boundaries? I define, these are my boundaries that I'm going to have in my business. Defining them as part one. And then I need to set them because people aren't psychic, right? I need to say, this is a boundary. And then when people intentionally or unintentionally violate boundaries, you have to defend your boundaries and say, that's not okay. You can't do that. Okay. That process if you haven't done part one and part two very well, you have to spend almost full time on part three, defending your boundaries. So I have a few clients who are in the situation where they're like in the most aggravating of all of those, which is defending their boundaries. So one of my clients um, uh, is dealing with a situation with subcontractors where they're not performing the work uh, and that is not allowed. And the they're um, taking action with the client, uh, overstepping and et cetera. All of this stuff is happening because the first two steps obviously weren't, um, the, the boundaries were not defined clearly enough in the beginning. They were not, uh, clarified to the people in question. So they weren't, um, expressed and made aware of them. And so now it's all in the defending stage and the defending stage is the stage you just don't want to be in. You have to get in like your warrior self and it is exhausting. So, um, number one and number two, like that defining and communicating has to be done so incredibly well that you spend almost no time on number three. I have another client, she's doing done for you services. The clients are constantly asking for too much stuff, which in the beginning uh, she was giving because, you know, sure, I'll do one or two things. Well, one or two is a slippery slope to now it's all. And so now it's like the the boundary moved like 200 yards and she's constantly trying to have to kind of like move it forward of like no not all of that kind of stuff like only this kind of stuff uh again super exhausting what's the right thing to have done set the boundary uh communicate the boundary and then hold the boundary one of the things i mentioned because we've been, been doing so much work with my clients on boundaries is like i don't i don't spend that much time on boundaries and i was like why do i do this and i was like well I, I, i'm not that great at boundaries with like my animals this is the how you do anything is how you do everything i totally don't believe that because i have terrible boundaries with my animal children um who are you know getting away with all kinds of nonsense that i would never let any human child or adult get away with uh and i thought well do i have terrible boundaries with my clients and i thought no my my clients uh, they have amazing boundaries and i'm like I never have to defend. I mean, that's like extreme communicate. Like, yeah, I think I communicate them really well. Oh, that's what happens. My perfect client profile is so clear that I don't let boundary violators in. So I'm like, you know what? I'm not, I may not be that great at defending boundaries with humans. I don't know if I am or not. Cause I never have to, I never have to. People don't violate my boundaries. Uh, dogs and cats do, but people don't because I clarify who is a good fit client for me. That's the only ones I work with. Uh, in the onboarding process, all of our agreements clearly state what our 
agreements are. So that's the defining and like communicating. Here's what the boundary is. And then if I have a client who uh, like texts me or sends me a private message or whatever, I I let them know, like, I'll you know, I'll respond if I can, but if I can't, I won't. Like I'm never in that position of having to defend. So I'm saying all of that so that you can think about like, what's your relationship to this and how is this showing up for you? And do you feel like you're spending all this time defending boundaries, which is like way, you're way too far when you do that. Are you having to communicate them like over and over and over and like, let's be clear, this, the boundary is here or like, sorry, no, that actually is outside of scope or no, you're not allowed to talk to the client because we've agreed that this is the, you know, everything, all the communication goes through me. Figure out what that is for you. So you don't end up having to just be like, boundary security guard incessantly because it's exhausting. My clients, a lot of them are spending too much time on what I would call small stuff. So I want you to think about when you're doing this exercise, if you just have like a lot of things coming up for you where it's like just a lot of uh, small activities, the things I would put in this bucket are like, um, like I'm doing the networking groups and I'm also in that association. I'm also doing this like marketing activities and I also have those emails and I'm doing a lot of if you have like just so much activity that isn't necessarily yielding results or you're not seeing results from that, I want you to really think about an 80-20 rule here. It's hard to, to do this in our own businesses. Like we do this with our clients. Like, well, let's look at the 80-20 of like the, the effort that you're putting in and the, and the reward that you're recouping from that effort. When you look at it in your own business, you're like, well, what would I give up? Because I, I like I do, I'm supposed to do in the, the networking and I'm supposed to do the LinkedIn commenting and I'm also supposed to send an email newsletter and so on. I also have to be on Instagram. And so I should have these Canva. Like when you start just like listing out what all of that stuff is. It's so comprehensive and it's so exhausting. And my question is like, well, what's the, where's, what's actually yielding a result? What's actually getting you something for all that effort? And are you willing to compress all of that stuff? Cause you're spending too much time on it uh, and trade that for something that actually would be getting you results. So that one might sound a little less clear, but I feel like uh, on a gut level, it might resonate with you. It's going to feel like, where are you spending too much time right now in, in the work in your business? Where are you spending too much time uh, that keeps you too many hours? It's causing you to spend too many hours at your desk or too many hours in like meetings that aren't revenue generating or are supposed to be revenue generating, but they aren't like that kind of a thing. This can also, if I look at my own example here, um, I, I have an initiative that I'm working on and it started very high promise and it's dwindling in like the where I think it's gonna go. Like, I just don't think this is like, I think I thought it was gonna be this and like, I don't think it's gonna return um, what I thought it was going to do. So the effort that I'm spending on it now has turned into being too much. And this is a good time to say, well, either this thing needs to succeed or we need to cut this one. That's the thing I'm asking you to do here. And the prompt for that is going to be where you're spending too much time. That is a list of examples, which hopefully are informative for you about like, here's where other consultants ha uh, are and can be spending too much time. And I want to wrap that up. And then I want to turn to the question of where am I spending too little time? Spending too little time is always like so informative. Like I know I should be spending more time doing X. Uh, in personal life, there's gonna be things like exercising, like hanging out with my husband and kids, going to the, you know, whatever, like those kinds of things, like you know what those are gonna be. But in business, these are gonna be pretty clear. So I'm gonna share what I think are a very important top three. And I don't want those to override your own gut response to where are you spending too little time? What are you spending too little time on right now in your business and potentially in your life? In business, the first thing I see people, my clients, mostly spending too little time is in connecting with people, connecting with other people in their business. So it makes them feel uh, lonely. It makes, makes the marketing less effective. Like actually connecting with others is key. So when I'm like, don't just be posting on LinkedIn, LinkedIn is a social 
network, we should be connecting with other people. So if you're posting, you also want to be commenting on other people's posts. You want to be sending messages. You want to be responding to other people's comments. It's like, how much can you connect with people through the medium of LinkedIn? That's the opportunity there. In your business, and how much can you connect with people during the course of the week? This doesn't have to be a lot of time. I think five connections, calls, meetings, appointments, however you want to call them, five of those a week is important, is like a good minimum number. And that can be a potential client. It can be a referral partner. It can be um, a, a, a thought partner, somebody who uh, invigorates you. It can be a you know a coffee chat or some sort of like, let's take this offline and get to know each other, that kind of a, a thing. I think five of those a week. And um, a lot of people have a paradigm of a, of a meeting. Everything is like an hour. If I say five of those a week, you think, well, that's five hours of my week. No, let's normalize half hour meetings and have a half hour as a default for everything. If we need a little more time, well, let's make another meeting for that. Let's make another time for that and they can come back next week. But if you have five half hours of connection with other humans, then you're gonna feel less lonely. That's gonna be more effective. Like if you have a, a one of those as a sales call or potential clients, um, yay, like five of those is a really good number. So connecting with people more, I think is really key check in with yourself about how much actual people time you need to feel like good and not lonely in the business you may feel like uh if i do five of those i'm set for the week i don't need that i don't actually need the connecting with people time i'm really good solitary that's totally fine i think five is um is for business reasons for moving your business forward reasons is plenty and on top of that you might be a person who like just needs more social i've uh even before the pandemic, I had a couple of people in my life who would be like, no, I uh, I need to see other human beings in person to in order to thrive. And I was like, awesome. Great to know about yourself. For me, I can see other human beings on a Zoom and it fills me up as if I had been with them in person. That's not everybody. You do you. So number one, a place most consultants spend too little time is connecting with other people. Number two is thinking way back many seasons ago i don't even remember when it was i had an episode that was about we spend too little time thinking and what you can do to grow your business one of the best ways to grow your business is to like have some thinking time i still think we have too little time thinking there's too much activity too much um flurry and um scurrying and all of those kinds of things and not nearly enough time in the business with just you like in your chair with like hands clasped sitting back in your chair and kind of gazing off into the distance and being like hmm you know i wonder like where am i spending too little time just having a spaciousness to like think about that it doesn't have to be at your desk obviously uh you know i'm sorry to say that washing dishes is a really great place for me to be thinking about things um uh, i think the spiritual house cleaning people would say that's because you're you know when the process of cleaning something it's like works in your brain to kind of like shake loose um chunks of whatever thought or things in in your brain and kind of get those moving um I, I love walking. I love trail walks. Uh, when I had places to drive to, I, I loved a long drive. It was just the best time to, to really get in touch with what my thoughts were. What's your place where the best ideas come to you, where you're processing? There's different kind of thinking. There is integration thinking where you're like, I just got off on a, of a coaching call and yes, I took a lot of notes, but wow, there were a lot of kind of like mind blowing things. I need to think about some of that. That's like integration. That's processing and integrating the ideas that you heard. That might be a walking kind of a thing. Um, I need to come up with some ideas for what I'm going to do in this a workshop that thinking might be like a brainstorming at a at a flip chart in your office with colorful markers think about where your thinking belongs in your business where and when you can be doing that and what the different ways of you think are and what accommodates them in terms of environment 
That is the thing I think too few people spend a lot of time doing. So consultants don't spend enough, uh, enough time thinking about all the things they need to think about in their businesses. The last place I think consultants spend too little time is on high impact, high value strategic initiatives. So we do a lot of little things here and there, like a little bit of everything, instead of saying, here's what I'm going to do in the next year. Over the next year, I'm going to have a single main focus for growing my business. If we were a corporation, there would be like a marketing campaign. And you might not have like a single thing that you do for the year. At Coke, we would have had like a quarterly focus, you know, a thing that we were focused on each quarter or um, season, you know, we'd have a new year's thing followed by like a whatever thing and then a back to school, you know, we, we would have occasions that we would um, focus around. But for us as consultants, I think you have the opportunity to say, here's what I'm going to do. Here's the initiative that I'm going to pour my focus into for next year. So is it I'm going to create videos and um, videos are going to be the core channel through which I'm going to communicate this message. Um, I want to reach this audience, this message, this medium, boom, right? That kind of a focused outreach or a, a initiative, like that kind of strategic approach, I don't see nearly often enough with my clients. Examples of that. I have a client who does a lot of event uh, things for her clients. Hey, guess what's a cool idea? She's going to do an event for herself. And at that event, people are going to have an experience of how she does events. And that'll help her to say, if you want this kind of thing for your brands, then you can have that. That's a major, major strategic initiative that she's going to do for her business. Um, another example is outreach. I've had, um, I've ha have a lot of clients who get clients by referrals, obviously, as you do too. I've had a few clients who are like, here's what's been amazing for me is when I, I think of who I want and then I go and get them. Hmm, interesting. So having a list of like a dream 20 and then pursuing those clients, that has been like massive for some of my clients. So that's an example of uh, in the next year, we're going to have a targeted campaign where we're going to go after, pursue through direct outreach. Um, you know, how many, how many of those do you need? Five, 10? Yeah, we're going to go get five of those in the next year. We're going to have everything we're going to do is going to be specifically around reaching out, going to them, courting them, um, and turning them into uh, our clients. Cool. Great initiative. Uh, not doing all of the little things so that when somebody comes to you and says, hey, do you want to participate in my um, in my little uh, group thing we're doing? No, I don't want to do that. I'm doing this. Hey, we're going to have this like little marketing thing. We're going to bring, bring a bunch of people together and do this. Nope, I'm doing this. So you have the clarity around the thing you're doing. Uh, and then the last example is um, writing a book. Uh, it's not for everyone and uh, it might not be for you, but I have uh, several clients who've written books. And the interesting thing about books is that the writing process is so daggum heavy and takes so long, usually like a, like a remodel. It takes like one and a half times longer than you think it's going to take. And then it's done. And then guess what happens? You have to promote the hell out of that thing. And you are so tired of it at this point, but you have to promote the hell out of it. And that is like the focus. So what's amazing about a, about a book is that it becomes the central, that strategic initiative I was just talking about, the core focus of your work is promoting that thing. So somebody who's doing an amazing job with this, and I just want to share her fabulous book, is um, my very good friend, Karen Eber, who wrote a book called The Perfect Story. Uh, I loved her TED Talk. Her book is awesome. I'm that far in it. <laughs> uh, and she's just modeling great, uh, just beautifully, like all of her communications are promoting that book. So if you get a newsletter from her right now, it's about the book. If you see a post from her on social media, it's about the book. Like she's extremely focused. Why? Because she chose a strategic initiative. And this is this book is getting her clients, right? So she's promoting a book that gets her clients, that, that establishes her brand, and does these things. Uh, but instead of like, hey, here's all the ways you can work with me, it's like, no, promote the book and the book leads to turning into clients. She's doing a single major initiative and she's putting a ton of her focus and energy into it. And I think it's doing a really brilliant job. 
So that is the answer to what are the things that I see consultants doing too little of? I see them doing too little connecting with other humans, with people on a steady, regular, weekly basis, at least five times a week, thinking about what they want to do with their business and then focusing all of their work, their marketing in, in their business around like a major strategic initiative instead of on like every little thing. So when you ask yourself these questions, you're going to hear what you're doing too much of and what you're doing too little of. And I would be intrigued to hear what you learn when you ask. You can reach out to me through any of the socials if you need support for growing your business, for knowing what you should be spending more time or less time on than I'm here to help you. You can find me and um, all the ways that I can help you at samanthahartley.com. And with that, I am wishing you a profitable and joyful consulting business.